About 15 years ago in our ministry with Living Leadership, we began to run what we call pastoral refreshment conferences. These are opportunities for soul care, for nourishment for Christian leaders and spouses, an opportunity to simply receive, nothing else, not to give. We wanted to provide an annual oasis to replenish, to be replenished and to be encouraged in the grace of God. We rapidly started to find at those conferences large numbers of longer term leaders telling us about how debilitated and drained they were all the time. Some wanted to leave Christian work, others didn't, but they couldn't figure out how to change the situation. They were all leading whilst feeling drained with no freshness. And that forms the background of what I want to bring this evening. I have no formal background in counselling. I'm not a trauma specialist. So this is uh, simply reflections from 15 years of mentoring church leaders and spouses um, around the issues that made them think about quitting ministry. One thing I'm not going to cover today is uh, when leaders make shipwreck ourselves, perhaps through our sin patterns or our abuse of power and position, ambition, pride, crises of faith. Uh, I'm not going to be covering those things because that would be far more than one session to explore all of those. I hope that uh, you have the opportunity to have the handout for the session in front of you. There's uh, plenty of good stuff on there. Whenever a leader or a couple uh, following the start of our conferences came to talk to me about the things that were draining them, I made a list of what the issues were. And I put that on the handout. The main categories were these, pressure on family and friendships, feeling devalued, feeling unable to lead, feeling that the job is too big and feeling spiritually isolated. All things that may have felt sustainable when they started, but are not sustainable in the long term. However, these are just presenting issues, as I say on the slide. They are what we see when people are finally prepared to admit that there is something badly wrong, by which point it may be possible to correct it, but it might be too late. The larger question underlying is, how do these kinds of things grow over time? It does seem that they often come to a head at around the age of 45 or when you have been in Christian work for around 15 years. At that point, the burdens have increased and increased on you. Your energy levels start to decrease. Perhaps you have young children and older family at a distance and lots and lots of pressures converge at that point. Roughly around the 15 year mark in the UK, that equates to two ministry positions or two sabbaticals. What happens is that things seem to become unsustainable. Ministry patterns that we establish in our thirties are not sustainable in our mid forties and still less in our fifties, unless we renegotiate them. And a common way for people to do that, at least in the UK, is for them to take a sabbatical, hoping that it will resolve issues of exhaustion and help them when they feel spiritually stuck and stuck in their ministry. But a sabbatical often fails to resolve things because there's little understanding of the underlying issues. And hence, many people use them as an opportunity to flee a ministry and to look for another. And in the mid 40s, they might flee Christian work altogether. As an aside, of course, you would hope that Christian workers in their mid 40s are at their most energized and able to bring on a new generation. We just can't do that if we're exhausted. The first rule of leadership, you know, the first rule of leadership, you've got to be alive. Dead leaders don't lead anything. When I began to probe underlying reasons for these issues, several things stood out for me again and again and again. Here they are. So first, what I refer to as ICED, I-C-E-D. This stands for isolation, complexity, exhaustion and discouragement. Isolation, complexity, exhaustion and discouragement or a combination of those. Second, people who had not given attention to their limits for a long time. 
who had let their load exceed their limit and had normalized the unsustainable. Often because people had unrealistic expectations and demands on them, but didn't know to start with they were unrealistic. And leaders colluded in it by never saying no. Thirdly, therefore, that squeezed out the inner life with God so that their inner life, their spiritual life, is no longer adequate to their outer life in leadership, and a gulf emerges between the two. Fourthly, people who were identifying that their life patterns and their habits worked for unhealthiness, spiritual, physical, emotional, relational unhealthiness, rather than for healthiness. We all have patterns and habits, whether or not they are intentional. In some ways, we are the sum of our habits. The question is, are your habits working for your health or are they working against your health? Fifthly, spouses being the least encouraged people in the church whilst carrying heavy burdens and feeling used rather than feeling valued. If you're um, in ministry and you're married, then if your spouse is the least fed person, for 15 years, then that will be the second biggest cause of people leaving ministries prematurely. And the last common underlying issue there was inadequate supporting structures and scaffolding for the demands of our leadership roles, giving out all the time, but without people supporting and feeding us. So lots of people crumble after 15 years or aged 45 or around then, because they set up unsustainable patterns when they were 30. And now they have a perceived inability to renegotiate it, or even to share that burden with anybody, because they've presented a mask of competence and spiritual health. When in fact, they were becoming more and more spiritually unhealthy, but now feel unable to admit it. One further factor um, is that over this kind of period, when leaders meet debilitating issues, what we tend to do is rather than deal with them and close them, we tend to just push them onto the back burner of our lives so that they are still alive, but not troubling us. And here's the difficulty. We, we, we all work with, um, with a sort of curve of energy and exhaustion, a bit like a wave, energy and exhaustion. When you have lots of energy, it is possible to keep lots of things on the back burner of your life. But when you're exhausted, you are no longer able to keep those things in the background. So not only do you deal with the issues of the moment that hit you, but when you're exhausted, all the other things come piling back into your life that were never resolved. And they hit you too, and that commonly has a catastrophic effect. So what is the process that leads down this path? I am going to describe to you what I think are five common stages. And after that, we will go into breakout rooms and we'll take some time to discuss. So here is stage one in going down an unhealthy path, imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, if you're not familiar with the idea, is that the thought that sooner or later you will be unmasked as a fake or a fraud. I get to do a lovely um, seminar at the European Leadership Forum. I'm expecting somebody will shout up and um, stand up and shout, stop that man, he's an imposter, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Nobody trained him, he doesn't have a piece of paper. We want to feel we're doing well we want others to think we know how to do everything. So we can adopt a persona that is different to what's going on behind the mask. I think that that can happen as early as a ministry job interview. When we say that we can do things in order to get the job, it's particularly bad if a church or a ministry has put up an impossible job description and we say that we can do that and then you have to live up to it or pretend. Anybody who writes prayer letters 
knows how tempting it is to only report the things that are going well, don't we? Psychologically, I am told that weakness and powerlessness are the things that produce imposter syndrome. And of course, weakness and powerlessness is precisely where we are meant to be in ministry. We are meant to minister out of weakness. Some leaders try to get out of weakness by becoming control freaks or by waiving qualifications. But the thing that in God empowers ministry, weakness, can also produce imposter syndrome. But it is stage two that is the next steps that trap us. And here we come to the cell, I-C-E-D, isolation, complexity, exhaustion, and discouragement. Commonly, a trigger presenting issue that causes fear will cause a longer standing lurking set of other things to emerge. That's why catastrophizing is quite common. Catastrophizing is that thing where all of a sudden you think that everything is absolutely awful, it's going to be a catastrophe, and you're looking at it through a false set of lenses, you feel bad, therefore everything is bad. You feel it's going to go wrong, therefore it is going to go wrong. Because when the last thing hits you that finally collapses you, we say in the UK, a straw that breaks the camel's back, a whole lot of longer term unresolved and buried issues emerge with it. So isolation, complexity, exhaustion, and discouragement. Many jobs are complex. Brain surgery is complex. But if you're a brain surgeon, you have a team, procedures, insurance, safety nets, lots of equipment, and many years of training. Lots of jobs are isolated, but not complex. Fishermen, for example. I am not sure I know many jobs that are as isolating, but deal with very complex issues, intersecting with so many skill sets and needs as we meet in many ministries and particularly pastoral ministries in churches. I think that it is both complex and isolating. Let three or four different kinds of complex issues coincide or three or four tragedies hit at once, either in our own lives or in the lives of those that we serve, and nobody copes. Leaders tend to be the focus for everybody else's hopes, comforts, fears, tragedies, and criticisms. But we do it without the safety nets that go with any other caring professional. You can't in the UK become a doctor or a social worker unless you have um, senior supervision. It's just illegal. And of course, the more senior, experienced and competent we get, the less other people think we need mentoring, counselling and support. Despite the fact that the burdens become heavier, the situations become more complex and more toxic, and the input that we receive ourselves starts to get less and less. In my own life, I would say that I was dealing with some very heavy things in my 30s and needed a lot of support. I needed far more in my 40s and more still in my 50s, just when people think I don't need it at all. The danger is that we end up as the toxic waste barrel for more and more difficult issues. I should have put up a cartoon image of a toxic waste bucket on a slide, but you, you know the ones I mean, they're yellow. They have a radioactive sign on them. We become the toxic bucket and our overall level of internal poison rises because there's no way to get rid of it except perhaps your spouse and they really don't have anywhere to get rid of it. Often we are prevented from even owning up to the fact that we find those things difficult by some combination of guilt, sadness, church culture that expects leaders to be positive all the time, negative repetitive conditioning, and we end up with strategies for avoidance and denial instead. 
the longer we fail to deal with debilitating issues, the harder it becomes. But there are many reasons to stop us doing so, to disincentivize it. That's stage two. Stage three is what I call the whirlpool or the vortex of entropy. We are sucked into a vortex in which we spiral round and down into subjectivity and irrationality. We are feeling unsupported and therefore we feel more and more insecure. We start to become more subjective. We only listen to internal dialogue going on up here. We start to view things through false evaluative lenses that magnify the bad and minimize the good. I've seen leaders become quite paranoid for those kinds of reasons. We start to fill up more and more of our time trying to deliver what we think people expect, hoping that we get some affirmation of it, and definitely hiding anything that goes wrong because we become increasingly sensitive to even constructive feedback. You become increasingly aware of all the things that are necessary to deliver, but you just can't. And we all know what it's like to have multiple competing complexities. I was chatting to a church pastor a little while ago who one day is preaching a sermon, one day is doing the church accounts, one day is mending the roof and doing it with three or four different churches. And not knowing how to break the cycle, thinking if others don't provide the help that I need, then they're clearly not concerned about me or my ministry. And if we're married, it's common for our spouses to feel obliged to collude in our feelings and affirm them, lest they become part of the perceived problem. The whirlpool, the vortex of entropy. Step four, avoidance, evasion and escape. When you get to this stage, you can feel that there is a gun pointed at the back of your head and it might go off unpredictably. You go into any meeting thinking, am I going to actually be able to cope with this? We are not safe. But this gun is only visible to us. You live with that subconscious script. And so we start trying to avoid possible things that might cause it to go off. We avoid difficult situations, controversial subjects, people that we find difficult, relationships that might be awkward. And instead, what we do is we start to build structures for personal security, bunkers. Whether that's with people we trust not to unsettle us, or by building a public persona, or becoming a control freak. The obvious image is the wearing of a mask, so that what people see is very different to the person that I really am. This whole downward spiral makes us very careful about exposing ourselves. We want to appear sorted. So we say um, yes to many things that we probably shouldn't because we want people to affirm us. We probably overwork at this point because we want people to affirm us. We never admit to mistakes and have to cover up sins because the idea of having to repent feels very, very dangerous at this point. Beyond our capacity, we don't want to be seen to be inadequate. But by this point, we have two faces. And then that adds the charge of hypocrisy to all the other things that we can't reveal. And then finally, we go off a cliff. This whole process makes us put more and more effort into delivering what we think people want. We become people pleasers. And we become more and more vulnerable to little triggers that result in seemingly large collapses. Also, we frequently work under highly emotional expectations. We have the energy, like I said, to push those on the back burner um, in the good times, but let something weigh heavily upon us. If you work at 105% for a long time, weariness will mean that it doesn't stay on the back burner anymore. 
these things are a feedback loop. If you get into it and you leave these kinds of patterns unremedied, then fear and burnout are inevitable sooner or later. They will destroy you. I sometimes struggle with anxiety. It usually happens to me in the autumn, commonly in the middle of the night. It took me a long time to realize what was going on with me, uh, even to admit to it, and then to develop a standard procedure for what I need to do when it strikes me. When I first experienced it, I had no idea what was going on, and I just went down and down and down. Now I have far better instinctive reactions and procedures that help me break the cycle early on before it gets too bad. 